what we will do, like I said, we're going to just cover a little bit of theory around it. And the idea actually of today is to, to familiarize you with the technology side of concept mapping. And why I say that is because concept mapping is something that you can do paper based um, you can do it, you know, however you choose with uh, material in the physical world, but because of the software that is available and it's a free software that you give, um, so that's always nice, which means you can download it, install it, uh, you can recommend it to your students, they can use it on their machines as well. So you can use it as both as a teaching as well as a learning tool. Okay, so as I said, this is just um, to familiarize yourself with the idea of concept mapping. And what is concept mapping really got to do with the course you're going to be doing? Essentially, it's a tool you're going to be using to unpack your course, your module, your curriculum. Okay? So, at the start, so bullet is not something that's going to be replacing what you can be doing in terms of teaching and learning. Uh, it's just another tool to add to your arsenal of tools available to you. Okay? So, as I said, concept mapping is really a tool that you can use in the physical world. What we're going to do today is actually familiarize ourselves with this digital tool. Right? So there's nothing earth shattering, but um, I'm, I bet you're going to find it pretty exciting when you see what is possible with this particular tool. Okay? So my name is Andre Daniels, in case you've missed that. <coughs> um, and I'm just going to go for a quick go around. You can just introduce yourself, tell us which department you're from. Um, and then we can just get a sense of, of who's here today. Okay. okay, so welcome to everyone. And uh, so here we go. We're going to start with a short movie. I don't know if my sound is working here, but let's just see. And I normally do this as a means of introduction, just to, you know, to get a kind of a, a, a general idea about what concept mapping is about. How many of you are familiar with mind mapping or heard of the term mind mapping? Yeah? There's a good few of you, so you, you probably might relate this to mind mapping, but what I'm also going to focus on is to show you what are some of the key differences between mind mapping and concept mapping. Okay. So let's stop this play. Even if I don't have any sound, it's so that the visuals is something that you <coughs> get something. So I want you to look at this, and I want you to say, to tell us what you think is happening in this particular um, excerpt, um, and what's the message that one can take away from this. It's a secret. It's nice. trying to find the safest spot. Safest spot. But it, to add on that, was not taking precautionary measures. Mm -hmm. How many of you can relate to that? I mean, do you know of anything in your personal life with something like this happens? We. So, traffic? Traffic, yeah. Just because this is about traffic. Yeah. But assessing the best route, and sometimes when you take shortcuts within the moment, you see that there's a traffic jam, so you think about alternatives, so you consider what other options. Yeah, absolutely. So let's. Did you go to Sorry, what did you say? I was going to say, I do it sometimes in the mall. You do it at the mall? Yeah. <laughs> was it speed shopping? <laughs> yeah. Do I take this one? Do I take this yeah. one? Yeah. You know. That's cool, so I'm going that way. <laughs> not quite the same thing. Like, I hope like when you shop it's not a split second decision, right? Because this is a split second decision making here. If you look at something like this, this is another kind of an ad. Just think about where does your eyes fall the first time, what, what attracts your attention the first thing and what is happening over there. Anybody else? Anybody else looked at something else first? And I look at the goal first. The goal first. Okay. And the other guy is in the way, so what's the best strategy to get to the end goal with this obstacle? Okay. We are looking at the floor, the busy floor. Okay. <laughs> Whatever it is. <laughs> and um, any roads, any yeah. pathways. Do, do you see any similarities between this one and the previous one I showed you? Yeah. What, what are some of the similarities? Different people, and I let me start with this just to get you thinking about what actually happens. This is actually two different formats. This is two different forms of media that have been used to convey a very similar message. Both of these things happen within split second. Unlike the example that she said about shopping, we actually have time, well, okay, this is not a life and death or the, the situation, you know. But if you were to decide, if, if somebody, if you ask somebody, listen, you had this incident, 
you had a near-death situation, what happened in that split second? Um, in when you had to make a choice, how did you come to that decision? And you ask somebody, do me a video on that. It might look like something like this first. Thing. If you ask somebody, now you know what, you're a very good soccer player. You kick goals, you're a striker. What goes on in your head? But you know what, don't write it down for me in words. Draw me a picture of what happens. Then you might do something like that. Okay? So it's two very similar kinds of information, but the way it's being represented to us is very different. Now, also have you noted the first one, the difference between the first and the second one? The first one, even though it's video, it's very linear in the way you access it. You've got to watch it from the start to the finish to actually make sense of it. However, this one, there's no linear, you can jump in anyway. Right? It's about the way we access the information. And so if we think of bringing this closer to home, we think about when we teach, when we're working with our students, how do they prefer to access information? Um, and you will find these days, if you look at statistics, if you look at what's happening on YouTube, YouTube is in fact the second most searched uh, social media platform, other than Google. So if you look at the content that young people of this generation are seeing, it's probably this kind of very you know, easily accessible information. This concept map, by the way, is probably the original, one of the original concept maps that we drew that is based on the workshop that you will be attending. Okay, so this used to be a four-day workshop. It's now no longer, it's now maybe two and a half days, close to three, three days. But this kind of outlines what that workshop would have been about. Here's another example, for those of you who have never seen what concept mapping looks like. This is a concept map that I do based on the area of work that I'm involved with, which is video production. So this is just kind of outlining what that would be. If we look at something like this, it's just a paragraph, but this is probably more what we are familiar with and what our students need to deal with on a kind of a daily basis. We open up a textbook or we open up a newspaper or an article and most of the information that the students get is probably in this format. Again, when you look at that, how accessible is it? You've got to start at one point and work your way through actually to read it. Right? You can't just start with it. For those of you, I don't know, maybe you, you know, it's a secret hobby of yours where you read backward and can still make sense of it, but for most of us ordinary people, we have to read from the one side, go through the whole text, and then um, draw some conclusions based on that. But, if I were to ask you, take that information, you know what, I don't particularly like this format that it's in, can you draw me a picture of that? Then it might look something like this. And so this is a concept map based on that paragraph. Okay? So, this kind of illustrates what concept mapping really is about. It's just doing a graphical representation of a body of information. So it's taking one format, which might be a little bit tedious and a little bit boring for people to get into, and putting it in a format that is a little bit more palatable, a little bit more digestible, a little bit more attractive, a little bit more accessible. So concept mapping is really a very creative process. No two people, if I were just to open and say, like, guys, Let's just do a concept map on that paragraph. Yours will probably look very different from mine. Because it is a creative process and everybody's got a different set of information and knowledge that they bring to be on new information. So, in a nutshell, the idea is, is to show you how the concept mapping tool works, how we can use it to draw a graphical representation of a body of information. And you guys, you're the subject, subject experts, you're the expert in your fields, you've got years and years of knowledge that you've accumulated. But the whole idea about concept mapping and how we draw it is we've got to start off with first defining what concept mapping really is and maybe what it's not. And I, when I started doing concept maps, I found it particularly useful just to remember this particular definition. Because it helps you when you're drawing to keep that in the back of your mind so you know you don't divert from what it is that you're trying to achieve. So if we just break that definition down and look at the first line saying, what are concept maps really? Concept maps are tools firstly, right? Remember, it's not a silver bullet, it's not going to solve all your teaching and learning problems, but it's a tool 
for organizing. Firstly, to organize. So you have all this information, and it might be laying all over the place. It might be, you have, might have a, a crash drive at home where it's gone, or you have files still. Some of you might still have transparencies. We still work with transparencies. No? Lost Oh, is it? Okay. So some of the old kickers are still going around, so you might still have stuff like that. You might want to convert it, digitize it, make it available. So this is a nice tool to organize all that information. So if you embarking on a new course, you've just started on a new module or you're team teaching somebody else, this is a nice tool to kind of make sense of all this information that you have. Secondly, now you have all this information, the content tool, um, CMAP tool is also used to represent that knowledge. Okay? It's not just about presenting it. Because we often we find this is something one of the main differences between concept maps and mind maps is that mind maps are very personal. I find it's a very personal way of representing information. So somebody else don't necessarily have to make sense, be able to make sense of it. Whereas concept mapping, it's about taking something, showing it to somebody else, and they make sense of it on their own. They should be able to. If they're not, then it means that there's something amiss in the concept map that you do. So always be that in mind is about taking this information and making it clear to somebody else. Okay, so if we look at the physical structure of what a concept map is, it usually is enclosed in a circle or boxes of some type, and the relationship between these concept, concepts or propositions are indicated by connecting lines. Again, that's very important, so it's not just about saying how do different concepts relate to each other, but it's actually showing what the flow is between the, the, the various concepts, and explaining what's the relationship between the concepts. So now we have all this wonderful tool, where can I use it in real life or reality? And so we, if we look at some of the applications, you can see it can be used to generate ideas, you can use it to communicate complex um, thoughts, you can also help to aid learning by explicitly integrating new and old knowledge. And so, for me, one of the main important aspects of it is also the assessment. That one can actually assess not just your students or your learners understanding particular concepts, but even your own. See, the challenge is, is that very often, because we're so familiar with our content, the subject that we teach, there is a lot of information and concepts that we assume people know and understand what we're talking about. So the idea is that we make the connections between the various concepts that we're talking about explicit. Because you will find you begin teaching, I don't know if you're teaching at first or second year level, you assume a certain body of info knowledge of knowledge that students are coming with. Right? And sometimes we use a concept and we're teaching and we just assume, oh, we merely go along until you, when it comes to tests or exams, you realize that there's a complete misunderstanding of a particular concept. So these are the building blocks of concept maps. Consists of concepts with linking words and together they form propositions. So if we look at some very simple example, like life, soul, blue, ship, democracy, those are all terms that has got a whole lot of other concepts that's embedded in it. So the idea is that there is a main concept and within that concept are embedded some other concepts, sub-concepts. So just to reiterate again, propositions are statements about some object we invent in the universe are the naturally occurring constructed and propositions contain two or more concepts connected with other words to form a meaningful statement. So when you read, when you look at the structure with a concept, another concept, the linking word between them, when you read them, when you read them up, it should make a statement that makes sense. Okay? So in most cases, these connecting words are verbs. If we look at this as an example, this is a simple example of a, of a, of a sentence saying my son played with a retract. Now in that one sentence, there are four main ideas, or four themes. So it's not just a matter of looking at a paragraph like I showed earlier, and taking that paragraph and now, you know, writing it up there and writing it down here and then connecting it. It's actually looking at what are the main themes or ideas that's coming out of a body of information. So it's actually trying to show your understanding of a body of information. So, just again, quick summary, this is just a kind of an idea of what's the difference between concept maps and mind maps. And if we look at concept maps, just here speaking again, looking at the structure, you can see it looks more like a, a big, like a network. Right? 
This is a concept map on concept mapping. And again, if you look at it, you can just dive in wherever, whatever catches your, your interest. And you can see it's got arrows showing you exactly um, the flow information. So I can stop and say organized knowledge includes associated feelings or affect. Uh, concept mapping presents those that organized knowledge. And it needs to answer focus question. You see, I can read it, and even as I'm reading it off the concept map, it makes sense. There's nobody that's to actually explain to me what the concept map says. If we look at the structure of a mind map, you have a central theme. You don't have to read this word, it's not even in English now. So there's a central theme, and everything else branches out from there. Again, the main difference is, is that with a mind map, the hierarchy, which means in terms of importance, is based on its position on that particular map. Whereas here, the hierarchy sits within the concept itself. Okay, when we do the kind of hands-on exercise, you see what I'm talking about. That it's not necessarily about where you've placed on the, the canvas or the paper, but it's really the concept that you've chosen. So you might, if you're teaching science or something like that, come up with a concept like uh, focus synthesis. And within focus synthesis, you've got a whole lot of other processes that's involved in that. So it's the term or the concept that really determines the hierarchy. So just in summary again, that is the differences, the main differences being designed and developed by two different individuals, Tony Buzan and Professor Joseph D. Novak. Just again, going back to my example of a galaxy. A galaxy consists of satellites, planets, and you can see this is just a very small concept map. They've got connecting words illustrating what's the connection between the different concepts and even though it can only consist even just a small one over this side here that constitutes a concept map it's because it's got concepts that's in a bubble and it's got a connecting word so the importance of the linking words if you think oh, but why do I need the linking words if you look at a simple example like this one again just concepts on its own wouldn't make much sense but if you add the linking words, you can see now all of a sudden you begin to understand what the meaning is. So the big advantage of concept mapping is that it creates this kind of, I like to think of it, you know, a bird's eye view of a body of information. Like again, like I said, I'm always here next to saying like, you know what, I've come into this particular course and it's just been handed over to me. I like to just, you know, uh, begin teaching on it and I don't quite know how it fits in with other courses or other modules. There's so many people teaching on it. I don't really know if what I'm teaching is important, why do I have to teach it during the second week of the you know, semester? All those kinds of things, one can actually begin to have a discussion if you kind of have an eagle bird's eye view of what the course or the model looks like. So these are some new um, slides I've introduced in, into the presentation because I'm always talking and I don't know whether people can always visualize what I'm talking about. So I like to make use of the analogy of puzzle building. So, I don't know how many of you built puzzles still. Nobody. I don't want any. The still. Okay. Okay. I still got a puzzle. It's in the cupboard. I'm gonna still build it. You know. So, but and I, I was searching the other day. I was sitting and I was searching. I don't know if you know what you call these tabs. These these things up here. It's interconnecting on puzzle pieces. Do you know what they call? Have you ever given it any thought? No. I lay awake night thinking about these things. So anyway. I'm going to tell you now. But if you relate this puzzle to concepts, you know, knowledge, right? That concept and then that's a concept. And then these things I would refer to as the linking word. And so when you put them all together, fit into the, you can see the linking word fits over there, and you come up with propositions. Because if you think at the end of the day, you've got to build a puzzle that looks nice and put together. Remember I started saying that in our knowledge, we become so comfortable with a certain area that we assume people know certain things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, but there's a whole lot of information that when we teach, we just look over, we just jump over because we, we want to get to the thing we want to teach, the thing we want to get across. But in that jumping, we often can miss a whole lot of very important information that might not be relevant or important to us, but in order for the person building new knowledge on top of, they need that in order to construct the picture. Okay? So back to back to the, what I said about what is the names of those things. 
And as Smith yeah, I came to this definition, I came across the site that said, despite the few themes of comprehensive classification of these shapes, cutting designs, there's still no genetic nomenclature. Manufacturers use a variety of terms as to puzzles. Puzzle pieces can have loops, sockets, knobs, holes, tabs, slots, keys, and locks, or any of several other alternative designations. I just thought that's an interesting thing because whenever I tried to explain it, I could never give a name for that thing. So, as I said, you start by throwing out your puzzles, and your puzzle pieces would be the concepts. And then you will probably look at the image, right? You might want to then group things, and this thing you spoke about are the colors, right? So you might want to group things with similar colors together. And then once you've grouped them together, you can begin, now you look at the corners. And in fact, the corners, in relating it back to concept mapping, is the theme or the focus question. Because you can build a concept map as big as you want. But in order to have a border, you've got to say, well, okay, so what's the focus question? What is the theme that's coming through? What is it that I'm trying to answer? So once you have all the puzzle pieces out, you've grouped them together, now you make the connecting. You bring the interlinking together, okay? Because that is what will, at the end of the day, what happens when you try and force puzzle pieces in where they don't belong? Right? You just bang it. You've seen kids that get frustrated and they just bang it in, you know? Doesn't matter. So what happens to the picture at the end of the day is you end up with a distorted picture. And similarly, I think when we begin to make connections with concepts that doesn't really belong together, or they do not make sense, in our minds we end up with a really distorted picture or understanding. And that's the whole idea for me around concept mapping, is to eventually put all these concepts together so that we both have a complete picture of a body of information. You've got to select the focus question. This is just like a very academic way of, of relating that to your points. What is the central word, the concept, questions, problem around which to build your diagram or concept map? Then you rank them, and that ranking essentially is the grouping. So you will find, okay, I've thrown all these concepts that I need to teach. If I group all these concepts together, is there one concept that, that I can give, or is there one name I can give all these concepts? And that will be the overarching concept. That will be like a big concept, right? We cluster these concepts that function at similar level, at abstraction, and those who interrelate closely. Then once we have all those together, then we add the relationship. Now I know it's very tempting to begin to make the connections immediately, um, but you will save yourself a whole lot of trouble by first getting, following the steps, first getting all the groups out, throwing out all your concepts, and then making the connections. Because either you'll, you'll find you'll have to break connections again, move things around. And that's also talking about moving things around. Don't think about concept mapping as a static thing. That, okay, I've done a concept map now in this particular area, now I'm done, I can walk away and shove. Okay? It's really a very kind of progressive and ongoing thing, exercise that will change as your knowledge um, changes. So it's something that's fixable, so you can have various iterations of a concept map. Okay, and so that is the reference if you want to look at any additional information. I can send you some more information on the concept maps and how they've actually been used in teaching and learning. Now for one, you can use it as a presentation tool, but the bigger benefit is really as a, a learning tool for students as well.